by Sri Lanka's best internet package for online learning and online working with many amazing offers. Call 1212 for more information. Sri Lanka Telecom. Lenka, tu kuma wedi karaga ne? Lao ju rupyal panhata du kala. Mama, en api te ekak bom. Tonight, absconding blame. Former President Maithripala Sirisena offered the IGP an ambassadorship to take the fall for Easter attacks. Through the eyes of the TNA, cannot antagonize the majority in pursuit of a dignified solution to the Tamil national question. Easy as you like it, a prison sergeant gives contract to inmate to assassinate the superior officer. Political Victimization Commission. Former Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe made a witness over several cases. All that and much more coming up on First at Nine this Saturday, the 19th of September, 2020. Nava Sunlight Sakura. Then, Dikukal Pavatina Sakura Mal Suandin. From Ada Derana, this is Ada Derana First at Nine. Live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to First at Nine. I'm Dhamnika Ekanayka. Now let's start off with your local stories. Former Defence Secretary had not been on good terms or not been in the good books, I should say, of former President Maitri Pala Sirisen in the lead up to the Easter Sunday terror attacks and there had been mistrust between the two. That's what the Presidential Commission probing the attacks heard as former Defence Secretary Hemasir Fernando himself gave evidence before it yet again. What's more, he said that the former president attempted to coerce the IGP into claiming responsibility for the entire travesty and resign with the promise of an ambassadorial role and other privileges. Former Defence Secretary Hemasiri Fernando gave evidence before the Presidential Commission of Inquiry probing these to Sunday terror attacks for a third day yesterday. When questioned on the intelligence information received pertaining to the attack, the witness said that every report given to him by the State Intelligence Service was limited to mere information devoid of any analysis. He said, quote, There is no course of action that can be taken based on such information. They are required by the police, the CID and the Counter-Terrorist Investigation Division. What I should receive is analysed information, unquote. A commission member then asked the witness whether he informed the former president of the lack of proper conveyance of information. The former defence secretary responded, quote, I did not attempt to inform the former president of it since the capacity to understand it or to explain it any further was not there, unquote. A commission member then asked the former defence secretary whether he underestimates the former president. The witness responded, quote, not underestimate people present during a certain meeting at which I made a controversial remark had lied to the president. Afterwards, there was no direct links with me citing lack of trust. One cannot work if there is no cordiality between the line minister and the secretary." Unquote. The commission asked the witness whether that uncertainty prevailed until these two attacks and whether it was a cause for the slip-up in security matters. The witness said that it was rife and it escalated day by day and did not reduce. He added, quote, as secretary, I took numerous important decisions. On each occasion, the president shouted at me and changed them. I had to face 25, 30 such incidents like that." Unquote. The commission then put to the witness that he willingly asked for the position. The former defense secretary's response was, quote, I don't know, people get some fervor, and that must be the willingness. Unquote. The state's additional solicitor general then asked the witness as to why the former president was not given the forewarning of the attack. Former Defence Secretary Hemasiri Fernando replied, quote, I cannot believe for a single instance that Nilantha did not inform the president of it. They were that close. On most instances, reports of the Director of State Intelligence were given to the president by Nilantha himself before I. In any case, it was Mr. Maitri Pala who appointed Nilantha as the Director of State Intelligence. Owing to the political differences which arose following the constitutional crisis of 2018, the State Intelligence Service became a political police. During that time, the prime focus of the State Intelligence Service was to spy on political matters and give information." Unquote. 
Then former Secretary Hemisphere Fernando made a controversial revelation. He said, quote, I went to meet with the President on the 24th of April. By then, the President had told Pujit Jayasundra, Pujit, take responsibility for this and resign, and I will get the Malalgoda Committee report altered. Don't you worry. You will be given your pension and privileges and be given an ambassadorship in a suitable country. However, Pujit Jayasundra had not agreed to the proposal of Maitri Pala Sirisena. I asked the president as to who is responsible, whether it's Nilantha, Pujit or I, for not informing you, as stated by you. I told him that it was Nilantha who worked closely with him. The president then fell silent and looked down. I told him again, President, don't even keep a secretary from speaking for at least 10 minutes. If that happens, this ministry cannot function. I'm resigning. At least let my replacement meet with you and speak for half an hour each day. My integrity is in question owing to what you said addressing the nation. I'm resigning. I said that and left after paying my respects and conveyed my resignation. Unquote. The chairman of the commission then asked the former defence secretary whether on the night of the 20th of April, Nilantha Jayavardhan informed him of an attack. The witness responded, quote, Yes, Nilantha had sent me a message via WhatsApp. It said that an attack could happen within the next 24 hours. At that time, I told Nilantha to discuss with the IGP. When I contacted the IGP, I was told that he was in the process of informing Deputy Inspectors General. Unquote. The Commission then asked the witness as to why he did not inform any of this to Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe or State Minister of Defence Ruan Vijayvardhana. The former Defence Secretary said, quote, Mr. Maitri Palasirisena had prohibited speaking with both of them, asking not to even attend a meeting which they participate in. Unquote. The Commission asked the witness to clarify his comments made to media after the attacks, where he said that there was knowledge of an attack but did not think it would happen to this extent. The witness's response was, quote, I was tired by then after being without sleep for around 48 hours. I cannot recall what was said to foreign media at that moment. Unquote. Then the statement made by former Defence Secretary Hemisri Fernando to foreign media near the Kochikade Shrine, aired by other Derna, was played before the Commission. Why weren't the churches protected if you had a warning? How many churches to be protected? But we informed, we informed that there is, a, we never expected a, an attack of this magnitude. But you had warnings about a no, suicide not, bomber. Not to that, not to this extent. It did say, say isolated, you know, maybe one or two attacks here and there and various things. We never expected it. it it to be so big. Afterwards, the commission told the witness that it could not see the 48-hour tiredness he was referring to and he looked to be fresh when answering. The former Defence Secretary's response was that he became fresh since he was angered by the questions. Enjoy a very smooth shave with the Big Easy 2 razor. Big Easy 2. Moving on with other local stories, parliamentarian of the Tamil National Alliance, M.A. Sumandaran, says that at least a sizable section of the majority community must be won over in its pursuit of a dignified solution to the Tamil national question. He adds that it is certainly not, not achievable if the Sinhalese community is antagonised, heightening their own fears. What's more, the MP also admits that the party was mainly looking for a political solution, disregarding a lot of economic issues faced by the people during the previous regime. Now, that he says that uh, it plays a significant role in the northern and eastern people's disenchantment with the Tamil National Alliance as seen during the last general election. Spokesperson of the Tamil National Alliance, Emma Sumandiran, says that failure to meet the expectations of the people from 2015 to 2019, when the alliance backed the government of good governance, led to it losing considerable ground in the August general election. He concedes that the party was mainly or solely looking for a political solution, disregarding a lot of economic issues faced by the people during the previous regime. Speaking to a foreign media outlet, Sumandiran said, quote, with the political solution also evading us, people who hoped that at least their economic lot would be made better were disappointed. There may be other reasons also, but I think primarily these are the two reasons that explain why we ceded ground on both sides, the hardline Tamil nationalist side, who are looking for a final solution to the Tamil national question, and to government allies who appeal to some of the people looking for better economic prospects." Unquote. He added that at least a sizable section of the majority community must be won over in its pursuit of a dignified solution to the Tamil national question, and without that, it is not achievable. Sumandiran said, quote, Certainly not achievable if we keep antagonizing them and heightening their own fears. Unquote. 
On the 20th Amendment to the Constitution, the TNA parliamentarian says that it seeks to go back to the pre-19th Amendment situation where you have a superpower executive president with unparalleled powers anywhere else in the world without any real checks and balances. He says that it has caused concern even among their own supporters who either think that these powers in the hands of the current incumbent itself is excessive or that another president later in the future will abuse these powers. Sumandiran goes on to say, quote, Singhala people believe that if there is a strong president, then any attempt to divide the country can actually be dealt with by that president, as opposed to a weak executive not being able to prevent any fissures in the country. When asked how the TNA aims to win over the southern people when there is heightened suspicion around the devolution of power, the TNA parliamentarian said that since the end of the war, the TNA repeatedly assured the people in the south that the solution will be within a united, undivided country. He said that in the Constitution, Constitutional Assembly process, the TNA even suggested that the word indivisible be included in the description of the state. He also said that the party asked that the new constitution be approved by the Sri Lankan people at a referendum and that the majority communities should be comfortable with and agreeable to the terms of the new constitution. Sumandiran added that such a transparent approach will win over the Sinhalese people. Information of a contract to assassinate Superintendent of the Kuruvita Prison, Dhammika Dasanayaka, has come to light, with a conspirator being the prison's sergeant. The Department of Prisons has appointed a senior superintendent of prisons to investigate the matter and submit a report within three days. Now with that, let's take a look at the latest on Sri Lanka's war on drugs and the underworld. Making submissions to the Kuruvita Magistrates Court via a B report, Kuruvita police stated that the sergeant at the Kuruvita prison has conspired to assassinate its superintendent with an inmate involved in underworld activities. According to the police, the sergeant is currently on a transfer from Kuruvita prison to Pallikale prison on charges of having links with drug traffickers and underworld figures. Police revealed in court that the sergeant in question had planned to murder the prison superintendent out of fury for preventing him from committing ill deeds within the prison premises and for removing him from internal service and assigning him for outdoor duty. Kuruvita police informed the court that the suspect had given the contract to assassinate the prison superintendent to heroin dealer and underworld figure Tilanga Rohita Ramanayaka, alias Ramanayaka Sudda, who is currently being held at the Kalambur Riman prison. The B report submitted to court says that the assassination was planned using two accomplices of Ramanayaka Sudda, identified as Sampath and Dinesh. Meanwhile, Commissioner of Administration, Rehabilitation and Skill Development of Prisons Chandan Ekanayaka told Adhaderana that a senior superintendent of prisons is appointed to launch an investigation into the incident and to report back within three days. Meanwhile, a woman and her husband were arrested with 800 milligrams of heroin based on a tip-off received by the police investigation unit of the Panadura division. According to the police, the woman, who is a model by profession, and her husband are drug addicts. Further interrogation led to the arrest of two persons who supplied heroin to the duo. An undercover operative was used in the arrest. It was revealed that the arrestees sell narcotics from areas stretching from Dehiwala to Panadura and they were taken into custody with 4.5 grams of heroin, six mobile phones and 5,000 rupees in cash in their possession. In Mount Lavinia, three suspects were arrested by the Area Police Investigation Unit yesterday with 6.72 grams of heroin and 35 grams of crystal methamphetamine, also known as ICE. The suspects aged 34, 35 and 21 were involved in drug trafficking in the areas of Dehivala, Mount Lavinia and Ratmalana. Meanwhile, two persons involved in drug trafficking in the area of Kegol over a period of time were arrested by the special unit formed under the superintendent of police in charge of Kegol division during a raid conducted yesterday. One of the suspects was revealed as a son of a renowned businessman, while 12.5 grams of narcotics, three mobile phones and a bank ATM card were seized from the possession of the duo. Elsewhere in Minuangoda, the police investigation unit of the Gampaha division arrested an individual with 15 grams of narcotics in his possession. Meanwhile, the Mathura police have unravelled a drug and prostitution racket which targeted school children attending tuition classes conducting over the weekend. The racket had been worked off in the areas of Mathura and Valigama. During the raid, police were able to arrest nine suspects with heroin and Kerala cannabis in their possession, as well as four women engaged in prostitution.
We will see you shortly after this break. Bear with us. Salem Bank, the bank with a heart. Welcome back. You're watching First at Night. Now, Sri Lanka's coastal cleanup program commenced today from Mount Lavinia to coincide with the International Coastal Cleanup Day. Prime Minister Mahindra Rajpaksha also joined the launch of the program, jointly worked off by the Marine Environment Protection Authority, our own Manusad Derana, and other environmental organizations. In accordance with the International Coastal Cleanup Day, the Marine Environment Protection Authority launched the Coastal Cleaning Week starting from today at the Mount Lavinia Beach under the patronage of Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksa. In addition to environmental organizations that joined in the efforts, students were also present. the beach cleanup program, which begins today, will run for seven days at several beaches across the country. Meanwhile, the entire cleaning program is sponsored by Manusad Derana. More various operations and projects launched by the government pertaining to Buddhism and the development of education and national security have drawn praise from the Buddhist Advisory Council. The council said that the policies taken by the president will help build a good and just society. The Buddhist Advisory Council that was established in April to seek the advice of members of the Buddhist clergy on government policies met with the President for the sixth occasion yesterday. The Advisory Council reviewed the progress of the implementation of projects and expressed confidence that the policies followed by the President would help build a good and just society. The President's media division stated that members of the Buddhist clergy had commended the government for prioritizing the preservation of historical sites of archaeological value, eliminating the shortcomings in Piriven education and focusing on its promotion, freeing lands with issues belonging to the temples and providing them with clear deeds. The government's focus on Dhamma school education, the national education policy and the development of early childhood and national security was also commended by the members of the clergy. The President's Media Division also stated that the government's focus on the crackdown of drugs, environmental conservation, creation of the background for a dialogue on Buddha Sasana and other proposals, including Buddhist universities being brought under the Ministry of Education, also drew praise. The members of the Buddhist clergy also stated that many parties had commended the decision taken to amend the Antiquities Act to address the long-standing issues regarding temples established in archaeological lands. The Buddhist Advisory Council is scheduled to meet on the third Friday of each month. Now in other local stories, State Minister of Provincial Councils and Local Government Dr. Sarat Virasekra clarified his remarks made on the 13th Amendment and the Provincial Council system during an inter-provincial subject coordinating committee meeting held yesterday. He said that he has always opposed the 13th Amendment and the Provincial Council system since its inception and becoming the State Minister of the subject has not affected a change of stance. अभिदान्नो तमे 
තමයි අපිට ලැබෙන්නේ. ඒක නිසා ඒ සම්බන්ධයෙන් මගේ තියෙන විරුද්ධත්වය 1800ක් දක්වා තිබ්බා. එතකොට මම රාජ්‍ය ඇමති හැටියට වැඩ බාර ගත්තට පස්සේ මාධ්‍ය නිලධාරීන් මගෙන් ඇහුවාම මතුමා එදා 13 වෙනි සංශෝධනයටයි පළාත් සභාව වලට විරුද්ධ වුණා. ඔබතුමා දැන් රාජ්‍ය ඇමති වෙලා දැන් මොකද්ද ඔබතුමාගේ ස්ථාවරය කිව්වාම මම කියන්නේ නැහැ නේ රාජ්‍ය ඇමති වෙලා හින්ද මගේ ස්ථාවරය වෙනස් කියලා. ඉතින් මගේ ස්ථාවරය එක තමයි. ඒක තමයි මම කිව්වේ. ඉතින් අවුස්ස කරන්න කියලා අපි කිව්වේ නැහැ. We will see you shortly. Stay with us. Welcome back. This is First at Night. Now, former Prime Minister Ranil Vikram Singh and many prominent figures of the government of good governance appeared before the Presidential Commission of Inquiry on political victimization today. The commission meanwhile decided to name the former prime minister a witness to several complaints. The Presidential Commission of Inquiry on Political Victimization today decided to name former prime minister Ranil Wickremesinghe as a witness who was previously named as a respondent in connection with several complaints lodged with the commission. Chairman of the commission retired Supreme Court judge Upali Abiratna said that the decision was taken after considering the evidence previously submitted by Wickremesinghe to the commission with regard to the complaint filed by former secretary to the Ministry of Economic Development Dr Nihal Jai Tilaka. Meanwhile former minister and member of parliament Patali Champika Ranavaka a respondent in several complaints filed testified before the commission today. He said that the anti-corruption commission was set up as then president Maitri Pala Sirisena was given the mandate to do justice pertaining to the grievances of the people against corruption and fraud. The chairman of the commission then asked whether it is the same grievances which were defeated by hundreds of thousands during the recent election to which the MP responded we bow down and accept it. MP Ranavaka further stated that issues with regard to the credibility of some members of the government arose due to them standing by those involved in corruption. The commission's chairman said that a single B report at least had not been filed against the former president and anyone who supported the government. Responding to the chairman MP Ranavaka said that investigations were launched against former ministers Anurupriya Darshanayappa, Rajit Sena Ratna and Sajid Premadasa. Chairman of the commission then said the investigations did not take place through the anti-corruption committee. Meanwhile, former minister Mangala Samaravira, a member of the anti-corruption committee, was cross-examined before the commission today. Now the grand finale of Derana Dream Star Season 9 is currently underway at the auditorium of the National Youth Services Council in Maharagama with three finalists vying for the title. Live telecast of the grand finale began at 7.30 p.m. on TV Derana. Nuandika Sena Ratna, Gihan Bandar and Fallon Andrea Jansen are battling it out for the coveted title where the ultimate champion will be decided through SMS votes of the viewers. The highest voted among them will be the next Derana Dream star. And that's it from all of us here at First at Nine. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.